am Dr. Sarah Wooten, and welcome to Dog Care On Air. On today's episode, we are so happy and privileged to have Dr. Robin Downing from Windsor, Colorado with us today. Welcome, Robin. It's really my pleasure to be here, Dr. Sarah. Thanks for the invitation. Well, and I should, so, Ro, so Robin's a personal friend of mine, but what I should be calling you is Dr. Downing. So yeah. let me tell you how awesome this lady is and why we want to listen to everything she has to share with us today. Uh, since graduating from the College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Illinois in 1986, Dr. Robin has been blazing her own trail within veterinary medicine. Uh, let me tell you, blazing is the right word. Uh, she's providing state-of-the-art and state-of-the-heart medical care for all of our fur friends. She is a hospital director and founder of the Downing Center for Pain Management in Windsor, Colorado. Uh, she was the third veterinarian in the world to credential as a diplomat in the American Academy of Pain Management, which is actually an organization for pain management in humans. She is also credentialed in animal chiropractic care, canine medical massage, and medical acupuncture for animals. She was a founder for the International Veterinary Academy of Pain Management and served as that organization's second president. Dr. Robin is recognized as an international leader in the arena of animal pain management, and she teaches at animal health and veterinary conferences around the world. She writes for so many animal health publications. This lady has won more awards than I can even count for her advocacy and tireless work for animals. She is brave. She is tough. She is articulate. She is blazing smart. Nothing gets past this woman. She is a friend, and we are so happy and privileged to have her with us today. So welcome again, Dr. Robin. Well, thank you very much for that rather um, amazing introduction. Thank you so much. Um, it's, you know, but really at the end of the day, for me, what it's all about is helping pets and the people who love them have a an enhanced, a lengthened, and a strengthened relationship. Well, man, by, by the work that you have done within our profession, I mean, you walk your talk more than anybody I know, and I, as a person, look up to you. So um, uh, what, I want to, what I want to pick your brain on today for, for all the dog owners, hello, everybody out there um, who are watching, um, is I want to talk about pain. Um, and here is a very basic question, but maybe something that just needs to get out there from a pain expert such as yourself. Dr. Robin, do dogs feel pain? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. So do dogs feel pain? So of course the short answer is absolutely yes. The longer and more nuanced answer is that um, it's very important for us as humans to understand that our dogs are wired the same way that we are. They have the same nerve endings, they have the same nerve pathways, same spinal cord, and interestingly enough, very much the same brain. And a good friend of mine, who's one of my pain mentors from the human side of pain management, put it this way. He said, if you have the hardware, you can run the software. So the hardware is the nervous system, and the software is the experience of pain. One of the principles in pain management that we now better understand is that there is this principle of analogy. And so Dr. Sarah, what the principle of analogy means is that if an experience, a technique, a surgery, an injury would hurt us, the human, it would actually hurt our dog to the same degree. And this gives us an opportunity to better understand if we have a painful experience and our dog has the same kind of event that we can really empathize because they will in fact feel pain to that same degree that we do, whether it's breaking a nail or breaking a leg, the experience for them from a pain perspective is gonna be pretty close to what we would experience as humans. So help us understand a little bit more because for me, I, as a practicing veterinarian, I would have 
pets come in with all ranges of injuries or sicknesses that could be considered painful. But I would have one dog that came in I used to have this bloodhound patient and he used to literally hunt mountain lions and his owner would come in in full fatigues, you know, with this dog with these horrendous like wounds and the dog was just chilling. And then I'd have a little Bichon that came in with a broken nail that's literally screaming. What's going on there? So what's going on there is really somewhat the same experience that humans can have as well. It isn't that those two dogs, the Bloodhound and the Bichon, feel the pain differently, but their interpretation and experience of their own pain is quite different. So think about those linebackers who work in the National Football League and the kind of abuse that they take in a game. They have the same kind of injury you or I would have if we were in their shoes. But you and I would have a very different experience of our pain if we were the ones getting tackled as linebackers. Well, the same is true in our patients. We have them express their pain through their own filter, through their own experience. When I teach veterinary audiences, I will often ask my colleagues in the audience to remember the last Labrador retriever they met who had an injury while they were hunting ducks in the duck line. And then I have them envision the Samoyed with a broken toenail. And it's the same analogy you've just drawn. I have a Labrador retriever who will walk in with a laceration across their chest and they'll have a duck dummy in their mouth and they can't figure out why they're not still hunting. And that's the way that it might as well be the end of the universe as far as they're concerned with a broken nail. This does not mean that they are not experiencing pain the same way from a nervous system standpoint. It means they are expressing their pain differently. And this is where we as veterinarians really need to take the initiative to help our dog owners understand that a dog is wired to survive a dog is wired, not necessarily to tell us that something is wrong. And so our clients may see a dog, their own dog, having some changes in their behavior that they interpret as, well, he's just getting old or she's just slowing down. When in reality, that change in behavior is driven by the fact that now that dog is having pain that we really need to address. And one last point I want to make sure I, before I forget, and that is, in the case of an acute injury, like you've just described, if we professionals don't partner with our dog-owning clients to address that pain appropriately when it is in its rapid onset acute phase, we run the risk of allowing that dog to develop into a chronic pain situation it's much, much harder for us to treat and ultimately will have detrimental effects on that dog's activity, ability to do what dogs do, and quality of life. What we now know is we can even have a shortening of life expectancy if we allow acute pain to turn into chronic pain. So talk a little bit more about the difference between acute pain in dogs versus chronic pain. So probably the easiest way for dog owners to think about this is that acute pain is going to be related to an, some sort of acute injury. And it could be an injury like I was running across the yard and I stepped in a gopher hole and I sprained my wrist. Okay, that's an acute injury. But an acute injury can also be I went in for a surgery to have my ovaries removed, or I went in for a surgery to have my testicles removed, or I went in for a surgery to have a small tumor removed. Those are also acute injuries. Those acute injuries create a pain experience that's actually pretty straightforward for us to address if we address it with the right tools. And we know now that we need to use a couple of different tools to get the job done. So we would choose a narcotic agent like morphine or hydromorphone 
really good pain relievers know we don't have to worry about addiction in dogs and cats. And we would also complement that narcotic with a drug in a class called the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug or NSAID. You or I would take ibuprofen or Aleve or Celebrex. Dogs have their own set of NSAIDs that we can use to decrease inflammation and decrease pain. We also know that in an acute setting, we want to start that pain management process right at the beginning, right away. By ramping it down right away, we allow the tissue to heal so that the tissue heals and the pain heals at the same time. Now let's shift gears and talk a little bit about chronic pain. So the most common source of chronic pain in dogs is osteoarthritis. And here's what we know about osteoarthritis. 20% of dogs of all ages, so across all age categories, 20%, one in five, suffer from painful osteoarthritis. That incidence increases with age. So while it may be 20% of dogs across all ages, once we get to nine, 10, 11 years of age, now all of a sudden the percentage is much, much higher. Chronic pain actually reflects some changes that happen in the nervous system that may make managing that chronic pain much more difficult. The changes that happen happen in the spinal cord and also in the nerves in the area wherever the injury has happened. So if we have a dog, for instance, who develops osteoarthritis in the hip joints, when we go to treat that chronic pain, we have to understand there are changes in the tissue that allow that pain to be self-perpetuating. There are also changes in the nervous system that mm -hmm. allow that pain to be self-perpetuating. So we need tools that will address both the inflammation and pain at the joint that has osteoarthritis. But we also need to take into account that we may have to deal with the nervous system as well, or we're gonna end up with a dog who feels a little better, but they don't feel as, as good as they actually should be able to feel. So um, you said a little bit about NSAIDs as a tool that pet owners can use to help their pets with both acute and chronic pain. Should they be using human products or should they be using veterinary products and what's the difference and why? I love that you've asked me this question because in the really bad old days, so you already revealed that I graduated from veterinary school in 1986. When I look back, I feel like we were using stone knives and bone rattles to practice medicine. It was so long ago. We had no tools, none, available to us to help with chronic pain management in dogs. None. We had to reach for human medications. And the unfortunate piece of that is the human medications that are available in this category, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, these are all incredibly toxic to dogs, which we did not realize at the time. So let me give you two really crystal clear examples. The first is aspirin. We used to use aspirin. And now we know that a single dose of aspirin in a dog causes gastric ulcers in that dog. Now those ulcers may not perforate and they may not bleed, but I it was a good friend of mine, a very, very rigorous researcher who is also a pain specialist who did that study. Single dose of aspirin, then looked with an endoscope down to the stomach and actually looked at the stomach and recognized we had ulcers. What a terrible, terrible thing. The second example I wanna use is ibuprofen, which is such a common non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug that pe for people to take. Well, the bad news about ibuprofen is it's very toxic to the liver and it can actually be toxic also to the kidney in the dog. And a dog who has an accidental exposure to ibuprofen will generally die from that intoxication. I had a patient, my family was just devastated. The dog knocked a bottle off the bedside table and ingested a few tablets of ibuprofen. And even with aggressive 
aggressive 24 hour care in an ICU, that dog died anyway. So these are two drugs that we use all the time in people, low dose aspirin to prevent us from having stroke and heart attack, ibuprofen to help us with the occasional ache and pain, bad choice for dogs. Dogs have oh, actually a handful of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs that can and should be used. So we need to use products that were made specifically for dogs and prescribed specifically by the veterinarian. One of the things that it's important for dog owners to understand, particularly older dogs who are developing osteoarthritis, is that first of all, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories alone will not take care of the problem, number one. We have to use other things too. Number two, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are not innocent medicines, and we must partner you and I, dog owner, veterinarian, to make certain that we do blood work to get a baseline to understand how well that dog's liver and kidneys are working before we prescribe a medicine like a non-steroidal. And once the end state is in place, we have to make sure that we monitor that dog effectively to make certain that we're not causing a bigger problem than we're trying to solve. So your veterinarian, to all you dog owners who are listening, your veterinarian will better help you understand what kind of testing should be done on your dog and how often should that testing be repeated if we choose to use a non-steroidal. Perfect, that is so awesome. Um, so what about cancer? Can cancer be painful in dogs? Another great question. So for certain, cancer can be painful in dogs. Now, here's where we have to have a little bit more nuanced answer. Many, many cancers that happen in dogs are not painful, at least initially. So we can't rely on a pain symptom to guide us to worry that a dog has cancer. That's why we have to rely on our hands to feel for lumps and bumps that don't belong. And that's why we also rely on occasional blood testing in our older dogs to look for abnormalities in the organs because a liver tumor isn't painful. That said, bone cancer is extremely painful. Cartilage cancer is extremely painful. And these are pain, this is a type of pain that's very difficult to manage unless we use multiple tools to manage that pain. So in my practice, for instance, I will often use a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug that takes care of the inflammatory component, but I will also use a medication called gabapentin that helps the nervous system deal with the kind of pain that is generated by a bone tumor or cartilage tumor. The other place we can have pain around cancer patients is in the aftermath of surgery. So if, for instance, I have a patient, in fact, I'm dealing with one right now, who had bone cancer and she had her front leg removed, amputated, because amputating the leg actually relieves the pain that's associated with that bone tumor. But now we have to worry about the pain that happens after the surgery and any ongoing pain that can happen because we cut nerves when we amputate the limb. And that's really where your veterinarian can better guide you particularly if you're working with an oncologist, an oncologist will be able to guide you about how should that dog be managed in the phase of its cancer treatment. So if I'm a dog owner, um, what do I need to know? What are the signs of acute pain in dogs, like all of a sudden pain? So typically, this is gonna be true for both acute and chronic pain. When we think about how can I, as a dog owner, identify and respond to my dog having a pain experience of some kind? I'm gonna look for a difference in behavior. Because dogs, as much as I communicate with dogs and as much as I really feel like I can really get in their head and know what they're thinking, there's not one dog who's ever come into my practice in 34 years of clinical practice and said to me, you know, I feel a pain right here and it feels like needles, never. So we are stuck because our 
our dogs don't self-report, we have to watch for changes in behavior. So what might some of those changes in behavior look like? Well, the most common thing that people would obviously notice would be limping. Suddenly, my dog is limping on the right rear leg. Clearly something's wrong with the right rear leg. Here's where we get into trouble. I've had dogs come into my practice where the owner's like, he's a little off in his rear, but I can't tell if it's the right or the left. He just seems weak in the rear legs. And it turns out the dog has pain in both rear legs. So you can't really tell, is it the right leg or the left leg? Is it weakness or is it pain? So limping, obvious. But here are some other things that are more subtle, like a change in appetite, an, a reluctance to reach down to the floor to eat or drink because it hurts the low back to reach to the floor to eat or drink. A dog that used to get up in the bed and sleep with you at night, and now they don't want to do that. Or a dog that used to get up on all the furniture in the house, and now all of a sudden not getting up on the furniture, or gets up on the couch, reluctant to jump down. Dogs that now they don't want to go up the stairs or they don't want to come down the stairs. They're reluctant to do the things that they normally do. Dogs that used to relish going on a long walk, the longer the better, and now they get out one mile and suddenly they're lagging behind. Or dogs that suddenly decide they don't want to go for a walk at all because they understand that if they do that, it's going to hurt them. Finally, things like I don't want you to touch me there. So these are dogs that have been happy to be groomed, happy to be petted. And one of the code phrases my clients share with me is, you know, she just doesn't like me to pet her there. That's a huge signal to us, the humans, that something's not right. Something is painful. Can, if a dog is experiencing anxiety, um, can that make the pain worse? Another great question. So here's what we know, and we know this from data from humans, and now we know this from data from dogs, that fear or anxiety enhances the pain experience and pain enhances the fear and anxiety experience. So here's something that, that we, we as humans need to remember. We know, and, and we can be confident in this statement, we know that dogs cannot and do not anticipate or fear their own death. But they do anticipate and fear pain. And because they live in the moment, they cannot see beyond that pain. So let me give you an example. I had a tooth that went bad, and I needed an emergency root canal. It was excruciating pain, nerve pain shooting through my face and up through the top of my head. But I knew that I could, I could see beyond that pain. I knew that once I worked with the endodontist, that pain would go away. So I could deal with that pain in the short term while I waited the couple of days I needed to wait to get to that appointment. Our dogs don't have that. They live immediately in the moment. And so every moment for them is in technicolor. And if they're experiencing pain and they are either an anxious or a fearful dog, their anxiety and fear will be worse for their pain. And the reverse is true. The pain will be worse for their fear and anxiety. And I think you can easily understand how this becomes an awful, awful cascade, like a whirlpool. And it just gets worse and worse and worse for them the longer we let it go on. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I can remember times in practice where like a dog came in, was in pain from, you know, some other part of its body and you touched it somewhere else and it just screamed bloody murder. Yep. Yep. And that's one of the, that's one of the really, um, gosh, it's, it's one of the insidious parts of particularly chronic pain is that once that pain's in place for a fairly long time in the body, the nervous system just goes haywire and it can actually create a pain experience 
far away from the original injury or the place where there is osteoarthritis. And that's actually one of the ways that I measure success in my patients who have chronic pain is we start out with very generalized pain that it doesn't matter where I touch the dog, they react and it's uncomfortable for them. As we move through our treatment program, our treatment process, what we find is that the area that is uncomfortable becomes smaller and smaller and smaller and more limited and much closer to the original site of the pain origination. So it could be the hip, it could be the low back, it could be a stifle joint, a knee joint, could be an elbow, could be a shoulder. But what we find, it's like peeling the layers of an onion. We go from big pain all over the body to a much more focused, much a much smaller pain to deal with. So there could be some people watching this right now, listening to everything that you have shared and been thinking, oh my gosh, I think my pet's been in chronic pain and I didn't know. I feel bad, I feel guilty. What can you, what can you say to pet owners who are maybe experiencing that like right now? So, um, and I know I sound like a broken record, but yet another great question that I love answering because this is a question I get in the exam room a lot. So as a, as a pain specialist, and word is out that I am that, I see a lot of dogs that come to me, um, often their, their owners have heard about my practice, the Downing Center for Animal Pain Management, they've, it, or they've been referred to me by one of my existing clients, hey, your dog looks like he doesn't feel well, maybe you should see Dr. Robin. They come to see me and, identif and I identify that, yes, the dog is painful, yes, your intuition is correct, here are the places that your dog is painful. Here's what we need to do. And then I'm often confronted with the question, how could I not have known that my dog was painful? How can I possibly get over the guilt I feel now that I know my dog is painful? And here's what I tell them. You cannot know what you don't know. You can't know what you don't know. But once you know something, you can't not know it anymore. So here's the reality. You didn't know that your dog was painful. So you had no way of knowing you should be thinking about doing some things for that dog. But now you know your dog is painful and I've helped you understand where and why and how your dog is painful. So now you can't not know that anymore. You can't unsee that. You can't unring that bell. Now. We start from where we are today and we move forward knowing that the future is going to look much better, much richer, and potentially much longer than the past would have demanded. I love that. That is so beautiful. Let go of the past, forgive yourself for what you didn't know, live in the present, and look forward to the future. I love that so, so much. So you talked a little bit about um, the where you touch a dog and it's painful and it's kind of this big everywhere. You know, you, I touch you anywhere and then you go through this, I love how you say process instead of process, <laughs> I love it. Uh, but you go through this process that, make, that shrinks that pain down to a smaller, 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 smaller. Can you, can you tell us what that pr process would look like maybe? So sure. So one of the things to understand about chronic, chronic pain is that it actually, I always add a second word, it's chronic maladaptive pain. And the maladaptive piece communicates the part that the nervous system has changed in the face of this pain that's continuously present. So we have chronic maladaptive pain. And what that tells us is that we have to break the pain cycle. So we break the pain cycle by coming at the pain from different perspectives. So how I express this to my clients, to my dog owners, is here's the dog with its pain, like the hub of a wheel. So they're in the center of the caregiving circle. The hub of the wheel is the, is the dog and the pain they're experiencing. And the spokes on that wheel that come into the hub, come into the hub from different directions, 
And those are all the tools that we use to break the pain cycle and to get that dog back to a state where they're able to function and be a dog, be who they are, be their best. So what are those tools? So I've already mentioned that non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, that's one tool that we use. So that's one spoke of the wheel. Another medicine that I use is one called gabapentin. Gabapentin is another spoke on the wheel. Gabapentin used to be called Neurontin, and it works on the nervous system. Specifically, it works in the spinal cord to help the nervous system not go crazy with those pain signals. But we don't stop there. We also want to be able to take care of supporting the tissues in the joint. So I will use another medication that we that goes by a really long name, polysulfated glycosamine glycans, PSGAGs. PSGAGs are molecules that we can put into the body that help support cartilage. It doesn't replace cartilage that's gone in an osteoarthritic joint, but it supports the remaining cartilage. And this is another medicine that's actually can be given at home. So these are all things that people can do at home. Another tool that I use are omega-3 fatty acids. We now know that omega-3 fatty acids, specifically EPA, can provide good joint support and good anti-inflammatory relief. It's important for me to insert at this point, you do not wanna to go to GNC and buy yourself some fish oil. We need to use EPAs and other omega-3 fatty acids that have been proven, this formulation has been proven to get into the dog and to help the dog's joints. It's another tool. There's another molecule called UC2. UC2 is undenatured collagen type two, another big phrase, UC2 is much easier. It actually works by the immune system to support cartilage. And there is a product on the veterinary side that uses that. And then finally, there's a, a new product that's come into our marketplace from England called UMove, as in you move, Mr. Dog, spelled Y U move, no O. And you move is yet another non drug way for us to address inflammation and pain in a dog's osteoarthritic joints. These are all things that the dog takes into its body. That is a large number of the spokes on my pain management wheel but I wanna make sure I don't forget things like medical acupuncture, that I don't forget things like medical massage. I teach a lot of my clients how to do medical massage techniques to help in between their visits to see me. This is something that can be done each and every day. I'm also board certified by the American College of Veterinary Sports Medicine and Rehabilitation. So I'm a rehabilitation expert, and I'm able to teach my clients how to do some rehabilitation techniques at home in between times I would see the patient. But many of these dogs come to see me and they work out in my underwater treadmill to build strength without the concussive forces of gravity on their already painful joints. The water buoys them, but they're able to build strength and use those muscles. I also use a technique called photobiomodulation, another mouthful. For simplicity's sake, we call it therapeutic laser, where we're able to actually help with pain and inflammation that way. And finally, another physical medicine technique that I use in my practice because my clients can use it at home is a technique called targeted pulsed electromagnetic field therapy. The easiest way to think about this is, think Francis of Assisi, there is a, a, a tool called the Assisi Loop that actually uses this mag electromagnetic force to provide a decrease in inflammation and pain in osteoarthritic joints. And this is something my clients can do at home every single day to help their dog feel better faster. So you can see, I think, Dr. Sarah, that there are many spokes on the wheel not every dog gets every spoke on that wheel. It's tailored to meet the needs of the individual dog, but every dog needs more than just one tool to get the pain under control and to keep it under control. Thank you so much. I think it's so helpful for people to know 
that there are many things that they can do to help their pet, many things that they can do at home. And it's important to work with somebody like you that is a pain management specialist. There's actually um, the field of canine sports re and rehabilitation is exploding in veterinary medicine. So it's likely that you have somebody nearby you that is certified in pain management. So Dr. Robin, I want to thank you so much for your time today and for sharing your expertise with our viewers. I know that you have helped people today and I want to thank all of our viewers for your time as well. So thank you, Dr. Robin. I really want to thank you as well, Dr. Sarah, and to all your viewers out there. Please, 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 when you think that your dog has pain, don't wait, get into your veterinarian, and don't be discouraged. There are many, many, many tools for us to choose, and the odds are pretty good we'll be able to help you and help that beloved animal family member. Thank you so much for that message of hope for, for dog lovers everywhere. So. Uh, that's all we have for today. Thank you so much for watching Dog Care and Air. I'm Dr. Sarah Wooten, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks for checking out our content. If you'd like to see more, please visit our website at dogcareandair.com or any of our social media channels where we're uploading new content on a daily basis. Look for links in the description. And remember, dogs do so much for us. Learn to do the best for them.